With regards to deferred taxes, the first thing I would like you to know is this. Uh, we've got from the accounting's point of view and from the tax point of view. From the accounting's point of view, we calculate something called the income tax expense. The income tax expense, what we can do is we're going to use simply use the profit before tax or we can call it as the accounting PBT and times by the corporation income tax rate and that will be the income tax expense. If we take the prof accounting profit before tax and times by the corporate income tax rate and that will account for three things. First of all, it stands for the current tax payable. So how can we calculate the current tax payable? The current tax payable is based on the taxable profit from the tax point of view. We take the taxable profit and times by the corporate income tax rate. Second, we account for the under or over provision of income tax expense, which means related to last year's account. Third, it also includes the deferred tax changes as a result of it. And deferred tax changes, this is what I'm going to be looking at, is the difference in requirements from the accounting and tax. And that's why we'll be looking at it very, very carefully. So we've looked at current tax payable, we've looked at under over provision of income taxes. If you know the deferred tax changes or the deferred, ta deferred tax movement, we can all summarise the one, two and three together and that will be the total accounting income tax expense. Now, the question is how we should account for the deferred taxes? Well, first of all, what do I mean by deferred tax? Deferred tax is where we are going to be accounting for the future tax consequence in today's term, but we are not discounting the deferred tax, we are not discounting the future taxes into today because we are not going to use any present value terms to calculate the deferred tax. To calculate the deferred tax, we've got the mechanism here. First of all, from the accounting's point of view, for the asset, we use plus, and for liability, we use minus. We use its carrying value or CV in accounting and we subtract the tax base which means is the tax written down value for the asset or the tax base of a liability. So if it is an asset we use plus, if it is a liability we use minus. So we take the carrying value of the asset or liability and to minus the value in the tax base and that would give me the temporary difference. For TD or temporary difference, it can either be the taxable temporary difference if it is positive, which means there will be future tax consequences of it. It could be the negative figure, which means the deductible temporary difference, which means we can save tax at some point in the future. We can use that temporary difference and times by the current corporate income tax rate, and that will be the DT or deferred tax. For deferred tax, if it is positive, and that's called the deferred tax liability or DTL, because we need to pay additional taxes on that. If it is negative, on the other hand, it's called deferred tax asset because we can save tax at some point in the future. So if you know the mechanisms, and the next step, what we're going to do then is to see a few examples. I'm going to prove it so that we can know what's going on. And the best way to see this before we look at the complicated concept is to have a go at a few examples here.
So it starts with the example number two. Okay, that starts with the example number two. Number two, it says the interest receivable is five hundred dollars. Okay, which means it seems that it's an asset because it's related to the current asset. However, the tax rule states that the interest will be taxed when interest is received in cash. Uh, it says, according to the accruals concept in accounting, it uh, debit the interest receivable asset worth of five hundred and credit revenue worth of 500, which means the credit income worth of 500. But according to taxes, it says there'll be the $500 we don't need to tax you right now because the tax rules in most jurisdictions is almost like the couch basis concept, which means we haven't seen any money coming into your bank account, we're not going to tax it. And that's the key idea behind it. So, as a starting point then, we will lay out the pro forma. For a second scenario, we take the current value in the SFP and to minus the tax base, and that will be a tax temporary difference with times by the corporation income tax rate, and that will be the deferred tax. Here is the interest receivable. Interest receivable is an asset. And here, the carry value, because it's an asset, we use positive figure. Here is $500. How about for tax base? Well, it says that the interest will be taxed when interest is received in cash at some point in the future. And that means a, a very good rule that I can use here when determining the tax base we're going to use the carrying value minus the future tax consequences. Here, as I said, I will tell you why in a second. And as I said, it's the carrying value worth a 500 because at some point in the future, we can use that 500. We need to pay tax on that. So it will be future tax worth a $500 here. And that means the current tax base is zero. Because at some point in the future, we have to tax on that $500 by the corporate income tax rate, so for example, by 30%. And that's why we take 500 minus zero, and that will be $500, which means when we receive cash uh, at some point in the future, we'll pay 30% of the corporate income tax on that, and that will be a positive figure worth of $150. And um, because it's positive, we have to pay tax on that, worth 150. So from zero changes to 150, deferred tax liability, so the journal entry would be to debit the income tax expense or debit PL worth 150 and we credit the deferred tax liability or DTO by 150 here. And because $500 of the temporary difference is positive again, in this case, it's the taxable temporary difference, or we can call it as the taxable TD. So, let's now prove it and see what is going on. So, suppose uh, that we've got the PO and one from the accounting's point of view, and one from the tax point of view. Here, suppose that we've got the year one as well as the year two in both sides, year one and year two at both sides. We've got sales revenue, for example, and we minus any expenses, and that would give me the taxable profit or the profit here. And we times by the corporate income tax rate by 30%. So let's see what it goes on. So in accounting, so suppose... I would assume a figure of the sales revenue worth of $1,000, $1,000 in the year one and two, $1,000 in tax, $1,000 in the year number two as well. Suppose the basic expense is $100 in both years, 
in both years a hundred dollars. So let's see the effect on this. Uh, in accounting, because we've got the first five hundred dollars with debit, the asset, which means the interest receivable, worth of five hundred dollars, our credit income to increase the income by five hundred dollars in the year number one already, which means I'm going to use another color. Here we've plus five hundred dollars already in accounting, but in tax there'll be nothing here. So it plots zero here. But in the year number two, when the situation has to be reversed, year two, there'll be no other interest receivable any longer because we recognize the full income in the year number one, and that's why there'll be zero additional income in the year number two. But from a tax point of view, it says when we receive tax uh, when we receive cash worth of five hundred dollars in the year number two, what we need to do is we're going to bring that as the taxable income in a year number two. For expenses, yeah, those are basic expenses worth $100, nothing related to taxes. And then we're going to calculate the profit here. In a year number one, we take 1,500 minus 1,000, and that will be 1,400. Second, that will be 900. From a tax point of view, in a year number one, that will be 900, and then 1,400 here in the year number two. And then what we need to do is we take 1,400 times by 30% of the corporate income tax worth of 420 in the year number one. Uh, in the year number two, we got 900 times by 30% and that would be 270. And then 270 in year one from a tax point of view and then 420 in year number two from tax point of view. So let's see the magic. Here, we've just calculated the taxable temporary difference worth of $500, but what does that mean? So, looking at the definition of the deferred tax, the deferred tax simply means we're going to account for the future tax effect in the current year, which means in the future years, and that will be in the year number two. In future years, and that will be in the year number two. In the current year, and that will be in the year number one. And that means we're going to be considering the future or the year number two's tax effect in the year number one's account. But the question is how we should do it. So let's see then. First of all, in the year number two, we should pay tax based on $1,400. But in accounting, we underprovide by $500, which means another $500 we need to account for the future tax effects on that. And that means in the year number two or in the future period, we should pay $420 worth of taxes. But actually, we only account for $270 in the year number two. We underprovide $150 in the year number two. Because we underprovide 150 in the year number two, or which means in future years, we're going to consider the future tax effect in the current year. Okay, so what that means is, I should say that 150, we're going to bring that to the current tax payable worth of, worth of 270. So why this would be a case is because, as I said, in the year one's accounting, profit before tax be times by the corporate income tax rate and that will be the year one's income tax expense. The year one's income tax expense, we've got three components in there. We've got the current tax payable, the current tax payable in the year number one as I said, we pay tax, we estimate our taxes based on the uh, taxable profit times by the corporate income tax of 270. And then we need to account for under over provision of income taxes related to a last year's account. There will be nothing here. And third, we will account for the deferred tax changes, uh, which means we're going to consider the future tax consequences, which means the year two's additional tax that we need to pay for in the current year, which means in the year number one.
In this case, then, we take 158, which means the future taxable uh, temporary difference times by the corporate income tax rate, which means from the current year's point of view, we estimate we'll need to pay $150 more in the year number two. We account for that in the year number one. And that means in total, and that'll be 420 as the accounting income tax expense in the year number one. And that's how we should account for it. Here, we are looking at the deferred tax, which means we're going to be considering the future uh, tax effect into the current year. But bear in mind, in some instances, that the tax law may say that part of the income is exempt from corporate income tax. If this is the case, then there will be no temporary difference or the timing difference for that. And this will be an example of the permanent difference with regards to income exempt from tax. So another example would be some of the expenses are non-tax deductible, which means we cannot put that expense into the taxable profit calculation. If this is the case, then it does not arise, it will not give rise to temporary difference. It would be an example of the permanent difference, and that would not affect our deferred tax calculation at all. But here we are saying that because we've accounted for $500 under the accrual basis in accounting as the current value in our SFP. But from a tax point of view, we are saying that $500 will be a tax base on that. Well, at some point in the future, because the future tax here will be $500, and currently there will be no effect on that. Because from the, uh, from the accounting's point of view, when we are accounting for the asset, it is simply like the resource that we've controlled as a result of a past demand, and from which the future economic benefit will flow into the entity. And that means it's like the present value terms. And that means from a tax point of view, it would be the same thing. It would mean the same thing. Because currently, we are not taxing it. But in the future, we'll tax it. And that's why currently, the tax base will be zero. Which means in the future, we'll be using that $500 and you need to pay tax on that. Why this will be a case, as you can see, in the year number two, because you will pay additional of $500 times by 30%, and that will be the additional expense of 150 of the income tax expense that you need to provide for in the, in the year number one. But we consider the future, which means the year number two, we bring that year two's effect into the current year, and that's how we account for it. So that's one example of how deferred taxes actually work. And let's see another case. Let's see the case number three. We told the accrued interest again, yeah, we debit the accrued interest asset worth of $500. I will credit the income in other income worth of $500. But it says the tax rule states that interest is taxed on the accrual basis, uh, which means we recognise the interest income worth of $500 in the year number one, it would be taxed or has already been, has already been taxed. And that's why, uh, from a tax base point of view, the tax base will certainly be $500 because there will be no future tax consequences. So, as always, we lay out the pro forma, first of all. Number three here. Okay, got number three. We take carrying value minus tax base. And that will be a temporary difference times by the corporate income tax rate. And that will be deferred tax. Again, is the accrued interest. So, is the accrued interest asset and that's why we use plus 500 I mean minus tax base we use carrying value which means taken by 500 before I mean minus the future tax effect here $500 as a positive 
in the future, there will be no taxes again because we taxed up when you account for it in your accounting books. And that's why the tax base here will be $500. We use 500 minus 500 and that will be zero times by 30% and that will be no deferred tax issues because there will be no timing differences because we taxed up on the same date. Now let's see the case number four here is the provision liability. The provision liability which means an other party is suing our business and then we've got a liability, we use a negative figure worth of $600. And the tax rule states the tax, release, tax relief is obtained when the provision is settled in cash. Okay, now we've got provision liability with debit expense and with credit provision liability. Because with debit expense, the expense we can use that to save tax. So, number four here, we take current value minus tax base, that will be a temporary difference, times by the corporate income tax rate, and that will be a deferred tax here. And then, what we can do, is to say that this will be a provision liability. Since it is the provision liability, we use minus. Okay, we minus 600 and then we minus the tax base. The tax base, as we've seen before, we take current value minus the future tax, consequ tax consequences. And because we are told that the current value, yeah, $600, we bring it here, and then we minus the future tax. Well, in the future, when we settle it in cash, which means when we pay cash, uh, we, we can use that $600 as the deductible uh, expenditure against our taxable profit, which means we can save tax at some point in the future. There will be future tax consequence here. And then we minus, minus 600 here. So that means minus 600 and then plus 600, the tax base will be zero. The temporary difference will be $600 negative with times by 30% of the corporate income tax rate, and that will be 180 as a negative. Since it's a negative figure, we call it as the deductible temporary difference. We can deduct future profit and save tax by 180, and that's called deferred tax asset. So suppose that the Deferred tax asset changes originally, we assume a figure here, from 30 up to 180. And that's why what we can do is to debit the deferred tax asset in our non-current asset by 150. We only account for the changes. And we credit the income tax expense or credit p &L to bring the income tax expense down by 150 here because we assume because we assume that the deferred tax asset originally was $30. Now, let's prove it. Okay, so first of all, we got the accounting books and we've got a tax book. We've got sales revenue and minus any expenses related to it, and that will be profit and we times by 30% of the corporate income tax rate. So you also have got year one and two, and we've got the year one and two. So let's assume a few figures here. Now, originally, we've got $1,000 of the revenue at both sides. And also we've got the expenses the basic expense worth of $100 at both sides in the year one as well as in the year two. And let's see the timing or the temporary difference here. So it's worth $600 in accounting because for the accounting in the year number one, we debit the expense or P&L worth of $600 and we credit provision liability in the year number one 
by $600 already. And here, we put that $600 into the expense. Into the year number one, we use another color here. So, in other words, in the year one's profit, we take 1,000 minus 700, and that would be 300 here, and times by 30%, and that would be the income tax expense worth of 90. In the year number two, then, there will be nothing here, okay, and that will be 900 times by 30%, that would be 270. Now, how about in tax? Well, in tax, it says, in the year one, we did nothing. Because tax is on the cash basis, not on the accrual basis. And if this is the case then, in year one, there will be nothing here. And that will be 900 paying tax of 30%. And that will be the actual tax that we need to pay for, worth of 270 in the year number one. However, in the year number two, we settle the provision liability in cash. And that means we bring that $600 as the deductible expense in the year number two. And that's why we've got $300 in the year number two, plus times by 30%, and that will be $90, okay, of the taxes. So let's see then. So, in the year number two, which means in the future, we should pay 90, but in accounting, we overpay by 180. Because we overpay by 180, because we pay 270, we account for 270 of the taxes in the year number two. It seems that we've over provided the tax expense by 180. And that's why we can save tax by 180 there. So arising from the deductible temporary difference, because as you can see in the future, which means in the year number two, we should pay tax based on 300 here. But in accounting, we provide tax based on additional $600 because we pay tax or we account for tax based on the original of $900. So if this is the case then, we could say this will be a deductible temporary difference to deduct from $900 down to $300 by $600, which means this will be the deductible or TDTD deductible temporary difference. As a result of the deductible temporary difference, by timing uh, by 30% of the corporate ta income tax rate, that will be 180, and that will be a deferred tax asset we can save tax. And that's why if we change the deferred tax asset originally from zero up to 180, what we could say is to debit deferred tax asset by 180 and to credit the p and by 180, and that's how it works. Simple. Okay then, number fifth then. Provision liability 600, the tax rule state, the tax relief is obtained for the provision liability on accrual basis, which means when we account for that $600 in our accounting, uh, at the same time, we can use that $600 as the deductible expenditure to save us tax. And that's why there will be no timing or temporary differences uh, arising between these, between these two, and therefore the deferred tax effect will be zero, okay? Because the current value, we use 600 here, and we minus the tax base, we use current value minus the future tax effect. And here, the current value $600, Future tax effect, zero, because we've already saved tax. There will be no timing difference again. So TD will be zero times by corporate income tax rate worth of 30%. The deferred tax will certainly be zero. Okay, for case number five. Now, let's see the case number six then. Case number six, it says the income received in advance is $700, which means we've got the prepaid income or the deferred income liability because we receive money in advance before we provide any goods or services to the buyer. And this is quite common in certain industries, especially in the service industries, such as in education companies. Uh, we've got lots of prepaid income here. The tax rule states, this will be taxed on the cash basis, 
which means when the business receives money in advance worth of several hundred dollars, it has been taxed. Okay, now I see that. There will be a special rule okay, for the income received in advance of how to determine the tax base, and we'll see that later on. But let's lay out the pro forma first of all. We use the uh, carrying value minus tax base equals the temporary difference times by the corporate income tax rate, and that will be the deferred tax here. Again, and this will be a prepaid income liability. of how we should account for it. So for the prepaid income liability, as we can see, it's the liability and therefore we use minus, minus 700 here as the carrying value. So let's account for it first of all. In a year number one, we receive cash from a customer with every bank worth of 700 I will credit the prepaid income liability worth of 700. I can call it as the deferred income liability, and that will be the same thing. And sometimes we can also refer it to the contract liability. In the year number two, then, we're going to release that prepaid income liability into our revenue. So we're going to be debiting the prepaid income liability. worth of say 100 and we credit the sales revenue worth of say 100 which means in the year number two from the accounting's point of view when we look at the PL as a proof later on we will see the sales revenue will increase by say 100 dollars until in the year number two so let's see the tax base here the tax base let's turn back to a page of a tax base of the liability, according to ICE number 12, paragraph number 8, for the final sentence. In the case of the revenue received in advance, the tax base of the liability is the carry amount, less any amount of revenue will not be taxable in the future period. So before that, the tax base, we use the carry value minus the future tax consequences. But here, we need to minus future no tax consequences. Okay, and therefore it's a, it's a different part. No tax here. I'll prove that later on, no worries for that. So for a tax base of the prepaid income liability, first of all, it's the carrying value, as I always said, bringing from the statement of financial position, I'm worth of $700 here. And then... The future no tax, well, uh, because in the current year, we've taxed that seven hundred dollars already. It's the future no tax, well, uh, for that seven hundred dollars, uh, because the total of the future seven hundred dollars will not be taxed again. So the future no tax will be the whole seven hundred dollars, no tax on that because it's a liability, and that's why we're going to minus the minus 700 here. And that's why, as you can see, minus, 600, minus 700 plus 700, the tax base will be zero here. So the temporary difference, we use 700, or minus 700, minus zero, and that will be negative 700 times by the corporate income tax rate, worth of 30%, and that will be 210. So, the $700 here will be the deductible temporary difference. We can save tax. The 210 will be a deferred tax asset we need to account for. So, we could say, suppose that the deferred tax asset changes from zero up to 210. What we could do is to debit deferred tax asset in the non current asset and to credit to reduce the income tax expense worth of 210. So let's prove it. Now we've got accounting, we've got tax, uh, we've got year one, year two, and year one, and year two. 
So first of all, we've got a sales revenue and minus any expenses related to it, as always, and that will be the profit. You take profit times by 30% of the corporate income tax rate, and that will be the tax expenses. Now suppose the basic revenue for both years, $1,000 at both sites, also in tax, of 1000 Expenses, the basic expense, $100, as what we've seen before, no worries for that, just make a life that much simpler and easier. And we calculate profit. Well, I will use another colour. Let's see that. From the accounting's point of view, we only account for the revenue worth of $700 only in the year number two, because in the year number one, we did not recognize any revenue at all, because when we receive cash, we put that into liability. And that means in accounting, there'll be nothing here in the year number one, there'll be $700 here in the year number two. And that's why the profit here will be 900 and then $1,600 here, and we times by 30%, and that'll be 270, and then 480 in both years. But in tax, it will be different. In tax, it states that when the company received $700 in the year number one, it has already been taxed. And that means in the year number one, we put that $700 in the year number one as the taxable income. And that will be 1,600. That will be 480 in the year number one. But in the year number two, there will be no taxes on that any longer for that $700. And that's why we put that zero in the year number two. And that's why, as you can see, the tax base in the year number two will be zero here. And then the profit will be $900 here, 270 So let's compare the future tax consequences and consider that future tax consequences into today. Well, looking up from the year two's point of view, the future tax consequences is this. We should pay 270, but we account for 480. We over provide by 210. Because we can save $210 as a result of it in the future, which means in year number two. Because as you can see, from $1,600 down to $900 as the reduction of $700 here is the deductible temporary difference resulting in the deferred tax asset. And what we need to do is we're going to account for that two, two, uh, $210 into year number one, which means in the current year. So this means in the year one's accounting income tax expense, First of all, it includes the current tax payable based in the year one worth of 480. And then under over provision of the income taxes related to a last year's account, nothing here, but deferred tax changes. So for deferred tax changes here, as you can see, uh, in the year number two, from the year one's point of view, when looking at the future, we can save 210. And that's why it's the total income tax expense in the current year, or in the year number one, will be 270 negative. As you can see, 270 in the year number one, from the accounting's point of view. That's how we account for it. No worries. The final example, let's see the asset, number one, which means the property plant equipment. It says the cost of a pp and &E is $1 million. Okay, now, uh, for both sides, from the accounting and from a tax point of view, yes, we can provide that $1 million 
as the total expense in our account. So from a tax point of view, we put $1 million as the total expense, as the depreciation expenses over the years to reduce our taxable profit. And in accounting, we will put that $1 million and spread it over different years as the depreciation expenses to reduce our taxable profit down. But because we use different policies, so for example in accounting, the accounting depreciation, the accounting estimates that we provide in the year number one was $300,000 and the tax depreciation was $400,000 in the year number one from the tax point of view. And that creates a difference, right? So here, we are saying that for case number one, we take carrying value minus tax base equals the te temporary difference times by the corporate income tax rate, and that will be a deferred tax here. And this, and this is related to the PPE. The PPE, the way that we do it is we use the total cost of 1 million, the cost of 1 million of both sides, and we minus the accumulated depreciation, or you can call it as the accumulated pre in accounting, and that will be 0 0.3 million in the year number one, and we minus the tax depreciation, or we can call it the capital allowance, it's entirely up to you, of 0 0.4 million in the year number one from a tax point of view. And that's why we've got the carrying value in accounting of $0.7 million from a tax base point of view. The tax written down value or the tax base would be $0.6 million. And we use 0.7 minus 0.6 and that will be $0.1 million and that's the positive figure and that's called the taxable temporary difference and we times by 30% of the corporate income tax rate and that will be 0 0.03 million dollars 0 0.03 million dollars is the deferred tax liability and we debit the income tax expense of 0 0.03 million and to credit to increase the deferred tax liability up by 0 0.03 million dollars the reason why this will be a case is because as you can see, of both sides, we can use a total of $1 million to set off against the future profit. But since we provide different expenses from accounting and tax, we use different rules, and that's why it creates a temporary or the timing difference worth of 0.1. Because at some point in the future, we'll pay additional of 0.03, even though we save that money in the current year. Now, the best way to illustrate this is to go for the year number two. So suppose the asset can only be used for two years. And in the second year, for PPE, we will account for another $0.7 million of the depreciation expense. We subtract that $0.7 million from the original of $0.7 million of the carry value. So that means the year number two the current value will be naught. At the same time, the tax depreciation of another $0.6 million to write off the entire asset value down, the current value will be zero. We use zero minus zero and there will be no temporary difference times by 30% and there will be no deferred tax any longer because we've recovered our asset current value already which means we fully utilise it already. Now, here's the tricky part. From 0.03 down to zero, all we can do is we're going to reverse the effect because we recognise the deferred tax liability of 0.03 in the year number one, but now changes from 0.03 down to zero by 0.03. And that means the deferred tax liability, we need to reduce the deferred tax liability of a total of 0.03 million and to credit to reduce the income tax expense of 0.03 million dollars here. So this 
it's a very tricky and very important part that you need to be understanding before you move any further. Yes, you can prove it. For example, in the year number one, year number one, you can still use the sales revenue, thousand minus expenses, and so on and so forth. And you can uh, uh, plot that figure into the PL as well as the PL in tax. It's entirely up to you. I'm not going to do this right now. Now, the best way to summarize these is to have a go at the uh, the tax base of an asset according to paragraph number 7 in the ICE number 12 as well as the liability according to ICE number 12 paragraph number 8 before we move any further. But before we move any further, let me summarise the rules for you for those two paragraphs for the tax base of the asset as well as the liability. So, for the asset related to the pp &E or development cost or the intangible asset, the idea of the tax base is the amount deductible. Uh, technically, the amount deductible against future taxable profit when the carrying value of the asset is recovered, which means the amount deductible, which means for the pp &E, it will be the original cost of $1 million at both sides because we can use that $1 million and we're going to expense them into the depreciation expenses to reduce our taxable profit as well as the accounting profit down at some point in the future. But we use different rules in accounting from tax and that's why we will result in deferred tax liability. So suppose that the, uh, from the tax point of view, it is the accelerated depreciations that we've used in tax, and that would give rise to deferred tax liability. And this is quite common in certain industries, so for example, the utilities industries, the government encourages these companies to invest in somewhere else, and that's why it encourages them, encouraging them to spend money out, to buy the investment, and buy the property plant equipment, buy the land, as well as the factory. Um, this is why the government is giving them some tax incentive to save them tax. And that's why it allows them to provide uh, more tax deductible expenses in the year that they invested those money into buying or investing those pp and &E. Alternatively, the tax base of an asset is we're going to use the carrying value minus the future tax. And this will be the same as we look at liability. We use carrying value minus future tax. But there will be one exception here. For a tax base of a liability in relation to the prepaid income or the deferred income liability, all we can say is that we use the carrying value of the liability minus future, no tax. Okay, so that's how we uh, account for a tax base of an asset or liability according to ICE number 12, paragraph number 7, number 8. So let's see how it regulates. It says, according to paragraph number 7, the tax base of an asset is the amount will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable economic benefit will flow into the entity when we re recovers the carrying value of the asset is talking about the amount deductible uh, talking about the total depreciation expenses which means the original cost of the pp and &E. and he also says if those economic benefit will not be taxable the tax base of an asset equals to its carrying value which means will not be taxable which means will be no future tax effect, which means we use carrying value minus the future tax. Here, the future tax is zero, which means the carrying value would be equal to the tax base because the carrying value, let's say 500, 500 minus zero, the tax base will be 500, which means here, the tax base of an asset equals to the carrying amount. Alternatively, 
We look at the tax base of a liability. The tax base of a liability is the carry amount less any amount will be deductible for tax purposes because for the liability, in effect, it will somehow become the expense will be tax deductible. And that means we use carrying value minus future tax and that will be the tax base. However, in the case of the revenue received in advance, the tax base is the carrying value minus any amount of revenue will not be taxable in the future period, which means we use carrying value minus future no tax. And in most circumstances, the tax base will be zero because the carrying, because the carrying value, so for example, in the last example, $700, will be minus the minus $700, and that will be a tax base equals to zero. So, this is how we account for a tax base. If you know this, uh, congratulations, because you know exactly how to uh, calculate the uh, deferred tax issues. But before we move any further, let's see uh, another definition, which means the def definition of the deferred tax asset. So from the previous example, when we calculate the deferred tax asset, usually related to those expenses, it is based on the deductible temporary differences. But sometimes the deferred tax asset can also mean the carry forward of the unused tax losses, which means that previously we've got tax losses and we can carry this forward to set off against future taxable profit. So for example, $130. If this is the case then, we can use, we can save $130 of taxes at some point in the future, we can provide that 130 as the deferred tax asset. Alternatively, it can also mean the carry forward of the unused tax credit. The tax credit, which means the government says you can save tax by $80. Because the government says that the government gives you the tax credit worth of $80, you can use that $80 to offset against your future taxes. And that $80 can be directly accounting for as the deferred tax asset. But please do remember, to recognise the deferred tax asset, you need to have sufficient future taxable profit. Otherwise, you cannot recognise the deferred tax asset to that particular uh, extent. And that's very, very important concept that you should bear in mind. The reason why this will be a case is because a lot of businesses may have the deductible temporary differences by simply providing for the expenses. For example, the impairment of PP&E, the impairment of inventories. Or sometimes the business may recognise the provision liability, especially in the mergers and acquisition transactions. So for example, we acquire another company, uh, because we acquire another company, another company may have contingent liability, and therefore, in a consolidated account, we need to account for the contingent liability as the actual liability, which means the provision liability there. Uh, because we recognise the provision liability in our consolidated account, the next things that we need to do is we, cover, we need to account for the deferred tax asset by debiting the deferred tax asset and to credit the income tax expense. And somehow in the future, to window dress the financial statements by most companies, they would like to reverse the provision liability uh, at some point in the future, possibly after the combination, which means in the year number two. So in the year number one, because it recognised the deferred tax asset, uh, yeah, the financial statements look much better because the profit figure look much better. But the company may not have sufficient taxable profit at some point in the future to utilise these deferred tax assets because from the tax point of view or from the tax authority's point of view, they will not give you cash in most circumstances. You are allowed to offset your trading losses against your future taxable profit to save you tax. But if you haven't got any future taxable profit, you cannot utilise 
those losses before. If you cannot fully utilize those losses, you cannot save your tax. And therefore, we will limit, we put the ceiling, we put that limit to the deferred tax asset according to the prudence concept per the conceptual framework requirements. And therefore, if you can see quite a lot of companies, for example, they are quite the loss-making entities and they provide for a deferred tax asset related to that. Uh, but we are questioning from the audit point of view whether or not you have sufficient future taxable profit to utilise those losses. Otherwise, you cannot provide those deferred tax assets to that particular amount. Okay, so that's very, very important concept. Uh, we'll look at a few examples later on related to these uh, concepts when we come to the uh, specific areas later on. Okay, um, that's how it works for deferred tax. And see you then. A P C accounting for your future.